PMS we covered in huge detail last week. Um, an awful lot can be done in a primary care setting. Number one is recognising that this condition exists. It's linked to ovulation, to a woman's normal cyclical hormones. It goes with menstruation. In order to diagnose PMS, then symptoms should be recorded over a two month period and that's called daily recording of the severity of the problem and it's important because it's possible to miss an alternative diagnosis if this is not done properly and it's very easy to see where there's a pattern um, where women's symptoms resolve in association with a period um, and they're at their worst following ovulation then this is a premenstrual disorder um, and there are a spectrum of premenstrual disorders the worst being core pmdd which is severe and can lead to suicide um, and it can be really devastating for women who know they've got a cyclical problem if they approach um, a primary care practitioner and they are told that this is normal and it's something that they just have to get on with so most women about 40 percent of women will experience some sort of premenstrual irritability but the important thing with PMDD is the impact it has on the individual and those round about them. And there are treatments which you can initiate in primary care. It's not just the combined pill. Um, so let's just go back to the cause again. This is caused by ovulation. And ovulation can be inhibited by using the combined pill. However, Many women who have this condition are particularly sensitive to progestogen. So um, a pill containing 20 micrograms of ethanol estradiol with three milligrams of drospirinone in a 24-4 regime is the better hormonal combination to treat patients with PMDD. Um, my recommendation is usually for patients to avoid the four placebo pills so that they have hormonal stability. Um, you can also inhibit ovulation by using sufficient estradiol delivered through the skin in the same way as you would deliver HRT. Um, but then you have to find a way of protecting the lining of the womb, the endometrium, and that's normally done with Mirena, but some women with PMDD are very sensitive even to Mirena. Some will, some will tolerate it. You can also use eutrogestan, 100 milligrams. I would suggest every night to ensure optimal endometrial protection. But again, that's out of product license because if you look at the BNF, it suggests using it day 1 to 25. Um, and then the other way of managing PMDD is to alter the brain sensitivity to changing hormone levels using antidepressants like Prozac, but they work in a very different way. They work very quickly and they can be used um, from the point of ovulation until the point of menstruation. So not the same as antidepressants used for um, managing depression. I think if you are struggling at that point and the patient has also been referred or considered cognitive behavioural therapy, then you would be looking at referral on to a specialist and there aren't that many specialists throughout the UK. We do have uh, what I'm hoping will become a multidisciplinary clinic at Liverpool Women's. So I think as a tertiary referral centre, it's reasonable that we would take uh, referrals of patients who've been difficult to manage, particularly in a primary care setting. But I think for those less severely affected women, an awful lot can be done in primary care. So we did polycystic ovaries recently. Um, I think you need to be really pragmatic about this. You need to be clear for women who have a polycystic pattern that they do not have a disease or an illness and the syndrome is associated with two out of three things usually that type of ovary um, infrequent bleeding which represents infrequent ovulation and i would use uh, clinical symptoms of excess androgens avoiding blood tests if i could possibly could in the past we used to measure lh and fsh and the you know, women with this condition have a higher level of LH to FSH than women who are not affected. But um, as I say, I would prefer to manage the patient than to manage blood, a blood test. Um, I think we were really clear that even if you are not ovulating regularly, if you're ovulating at all, then there is a risk of pregnancy. And if pregnancy is not what the patient wants, then she should use contraception. 
Many women with PCOS are overweight and the recommendation if women are considering a pregnancy is to try to achieve a body mass index less than 30. So treat the problem. If the problem is uh, the patient in front of you is struggling with their weight, then primary care is the place to go for support to lose weight. And, you know, it's a fairly simple um, recommendation, less calories in, more calories out, really difficult to do. And I think we need to be really, really sympathetic to these women because they need less calories than many other women who are not affected. But as the body weight comes down, sex hormone binding globulin, which is like a sponge, increases in size and will mop up those ex excess androgens. So that's a way of managing hairiness um, and acne. Um, so the, and the, so we've done weight, we've done excess androgens. You can also use uh, hormones which are anti-androgenic. So that might be, if you were able to, a pill called Dianet. That's the most anti-androgenic combined pill. But you have to be careful about contraindications. And in this population, the commonest contraindication is being overweight. Um, and then... Although women don't always bleed very frequently, when they do, it can be incredibly heavy. And the problem here is that if ovulation is infrequent, but the primordial follicles are being stimulated and they are producing estrogen, then the endometrium can become thick. It can become hyperplastic, which is a risk factor for cancer. So historically, we always induced a withdrawal bleed. It's much, much better for the patient if she doesn't bleed at all, but you provide her with something which is going to keep her endometrium thin. So that might be a Mirena or an alternative intrauterine system like Levacert or even Kylina or JDS. Or it might be that you put her on a desogestrel progesterone-only pill that keeps the endometrium super thin and you do not need to induce a withdrawal bleed in these women. Women who are on a combined pill like Dianet or a combined pill with Drospirinone like Yasmin will have a withdrawal bleed if they want one, but it's much, much better for women on the combined pill to miss the withdrawal bleed. So you have to understand what the withdrawal bleed was about. Um, and as long as you've kept the patient's endometrium thin, she doesn't need to have it. So I think I said before, this is a complicated endocrine condition. Um, and I think keep it as simple as you possibly can. So what you see there is, is the ultrasound appearance of a classic polycystic ovary. They're bigger uh, than an average ovary, probably the size of a hen's egg, whereas a normal ovary will be the size of a walnut. Uh, and that's the gross appearance on the right there. So these women will have um, frequently have a higher baseline luteinizing hormone level. They don't have the peak uh, that you see in women who are not affected. They're often overweight um, and they, if they are overweight, they can become insulin resistant, which leads to high levels. And actually that kind of multiplies the effects of the other things. And, and these three drivers in different degrees in different women will be the cause of, of higher male hormone levels. So both um, the issues with sex hormone binding globulin and insulin resistance can be managed by weight loss. Not all women with polycystic ovarian syndrome are overweight. You do get slim PCOS, but those women have a higher LH level. So the main driver for the slim PCOS women are high levels of LH. So this is a really simplified means of managing women who have high levels of androgen in association with PCOS and they also have um, high insulin levels. So weight reduction, number one, definitely, definitely better done in primary care. Then decreasing gonadotrophins, we can't just decrease LH. So we decrease both LH and FSH by using combined hormonal contraception if we can, or even some of the progestogen only methods. Desogestrel pills will um, inhibit ovulation and decrease both uh, gonadotrophins. Intrauterine systems do not inhibit ovulation, so women may still have a cycle if they have a cycle at all. Um, and I would be... I would not be in favour of using injectable contraception for overweight women with PCOS because about a third of women using injectable contraception like Depo-Provera will gain weight. 
as your weight goes down, your sponge goes up, so that will increase sex hormone binding globulin. It will mop up those excess androgens, and actually, that can change the appearance of the ovary and resolve the problem. We sometimes use metformin uh, as a way of reducing insulin. That's very controversial, but it is a good way of um, preparing women for a pregnancy, particularly if you're going to recommend a drug like clomiphene to um, stimulate ovulation. And the best way of reducing uh, androgenic effects is to use a drug which blocks the androgen receptor, so an anti-androgenic uh, progestin, either cyprotrone acetate or drospirinone. Uh, and I have, in women who can't take the combined pill, used a Mirena uh, along with cyprotrone acetate 25 milligrams daily as an anti-androgen. And that's a much higher dose than you get in Dianet. But it does make a very big difference to, to some women. But it's really, really important that those women don't become pregnant by mistake because that's potentially teratogenic. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay. Oh, so, okay, so when it comes to contraception, there are lots of options. Um, I think it would be nice for women with PCOS to support them to reduce their weight, uh, number one. And as their body mass index drops below 30, then the risk of spontaneous ovulation goes up um, pretty quickly and the risk of pregnancy goes up. Um, so it just really depends what the individual patient's desire is how, how you manage the condition and you may manage it with contraception in the short term in order um, to achieve an optimal body mass index but just remember that because women have polycystic ovarian syndrome doesn't mean they can't have hormonal contraception they can have any of the methods usually that don't have um, estrogen in and if it's a fertility issue um, then obviously simulating ovulation is the way forward so Let's just look at subfertility very briefly because most of this should be done uh, in secondary care. However, I think the history can be done in a primary care setting. Many, many couples don't achieve a pregnancy because they're not having sex at the right time. So for a couple who are failing to achieve a pregnancy, I would normally recommend something really simple and free, uh, an app like Fertility Friend. I think buy a cheap and cheerful thermometer. Don't you don't need um, ovulation sticks. You can um, check your body, you check your basal uh, basal temperature every morning before you do anything at all. Before you turn over in bed, lift up a book, certainly before you have a cup of coffee, and chart it on the app. And what you should see is after ovulation, a small but sustained rise in body temperature. If that's not happening, then she's unlikely to be ovulating. And you need three things to conceive. You need eggs, patent tubes, and you need sperm. So it may be appropriate that you can send the male partner for semen analysis. And if nothing's happening and she's ovulating and he's got good healthy sperm, then you might want to consider referring on um, for a test of tubal patency. And we normally use something called high cozy. Now that can be done in a community setting. It's a contrast which is, in, is um, put inside of the uterus and then spills out through the fallopian tubes if they're patent. Um, there are false positives with that because you can get spasm in the tube, but it's a very simple way of testing tubal patency. And if the tubes are blocked, then she's not going to get pregnant. But if she's got good eggs, patent tubes, and he's got healthy sperm, then 25% is the rate of conception if everything's good in any one cycle. And we would normally say 9 out of 10 couples will conceive within a year. They have to be having sex around the time of ovulation, so I would normally say... Track your cycle, have sex alternate days from about day nine onwards. Once the egg's gone, it's too late. She's not going to get pregnant. So there really is a very small window of opportunity there. But the history, the, rec the temperature charts, um, these can all be done really well in a primary care setting. Oops, I think I definitely... Uh, yeah, and just to know a little bit about assisted conception. So I don't think... there. I don't think it's appropriate for GPs to be delivering clomiphene unless they have the ability to um, follicle track in the first cycle, which is a nice recommendation. 
Many of you who've been practicing for a long time probably have given clomiphene. Um, I've done it in the community setting, but I've done it with ultrasound and I would always start with a really low dose and that's very variable. It depends who's doing it, but why use a higher dose of something if you don't need to? And I think we just have to be a little bit wary about multiple pregnancies. You have to tell women if they're having clomiphene that there's a risk of um, multiple pregnancy. And um, in a secondary care setting, we used to do something called um, ovari ovarian drilling, which they get rid of all those little unruptured follicles around the outside. So polycystic is a bad terminology. These are not cysts, they're unruptured follicles. Um, and then there's the option for FSH injections, which actually are very, very successful in some women. So particularly women who've got hypothalamic hypogonadism, so really very slim women, very sporty women, everything just shuts down. Um, but they have norm, a normal FSH. Um, and sometimes they have a low AMH, but they will often respond well to FSH injections. And that means that they might not have to go ahead and um, have IVF. That would be the end of the line. And I think particularly in this area, we're very lucky that we have the Hewitt Centre to refer patients on to. So a kind of thing, I've come round to thinking that actually giving clomiphene anywhere apart from a fertility clinic is quite fraught uh, because the monitoring is difficult to do. So the article I'm going to upload for you, as I said before, was around uh, urogynecology in a primary care setting. Um, so we'll just start with prolapse. Uh, prolapse can either be the front wall, which is a cystocele, the back wall, which is either a rectocele or an endocele, and you can't tell the difference between those things, or the vault uh, in, in a woman. The, uh, you can either get a vault prolapse in a woman who's had a hysterectomy or you can get something called a prosodentia where the uterus kind of turns itself inside out and that looks really very similar to a penis and it can be managed using a pessary I think you can um, do an awful lot actually to keep some of these patients out of a secondary care setting and I think particularly now post-covid a lot of patients and older patients are quite frightened about going to a hospital setting and the other thing which is important is that you should give these women local estrogen therapy to improve the tissue quality pelvic floor exercises make a huge difference particularly in women with uh, urinary incontinence or um either stress or, or urgency so I think they those are also important they can um patients can benefit from the support of a specialist pelvic floor physiotherapist and I'm hoping that one of my colleagues is going to do one of the podcasts for us to um further expand on that so on the next slide I think we've got the uh, pictures of various different pessaries ring pest oh no got the thing about surgery can be dangerous okay this is important so if well and i'm not a surgeon and and this i, I may well be criticized by uh, surgical colleagues for saying this but if you operate on somebody then they will heal with fibrous tissue which is weaker than muscle so i i like to think about the pelvic floor as a basket and it's made up of muscle and fibrous tissue um, you can strengthen the the muscle but not the fibrous tissue and you can make the situation worse by operating. Um, I've seen many patients who've had several operations. And so my personal opinion is that we should try and avoid surgery if we can. Uh, and I think this can be done from the menopause transition onwards to make sure that we ask women about symptoms. Is there something coming down? Are they aware of bulging of the vaginal walls? Are they having bladder problems? Are they having bowel problems? Think about risk factors for prolapse. Standing on two legs is a risk factor. Um, having babies is a massive problem, particularly instrumental deliveries. Um, and then chronic cough and constipation. So smoking is a risk factor because it makes women cough. So these are that's a really quick summary of what I would ask a patient. And then, if at all possible, I would manage her with a pessary. Uh, it's coming. Uh, so ring pessaries come in various different sizes. Um, personally, I would do that by experience. Um, so it's quite difficult to be proscriptive about what size of ring you would start with. The silicon rings and two companies make silicon rings are much better. Folding silicon rings. Um, they ha have at least a five year uh, span. Um, they 
the patient actually if possible should take them out every couple of weeks leave them out overnight and then put them back in by themselves very similar to um diaphragms for contraception but it depends on the patient and it depends on the age of the patient it depends on the manual dexterity of the patient the problem with leaving things in for say six months which you can do is that you know it's a foreign body and it will be associated with a foreign body effect so you may get an increase in vaginal discharge in bleeding which then leads to investigations for postmenopausal bleeding and then the other type of pessary you see there is a gellhorn pessary but there are different space occupying pessaries, uh, which I think are a little bit more complicated. Um, there are some great pessary days available. Uh, Milex is one of the companies that makes pessaries and they do pessary days. So it's not impossible to do this in, in a general practice setting. But again, you would need a database to make sure that these patients are brought back at least a couple of times a year for their pessary to be removed, washed and replaced. Uh, and as I said before, the silicon pessaries have about a five year uh, span, age span, and I think all women who are using pessaries, if you can encourage them to use local oestrogen, and my preference would be either Ovestin 0.1% cream, or, which is oestriol, or um, Vagifem 10 micrograms, which is oestradiol locally. Um, there's lots of different pessaries there. I have to say, the pessaries which I use are either the Gellhorn pessary, uh, ring pessaries. What you see on the far left are ring pessaries with a diaphragm. They're quite good. They're quite supportive. Cubes are good. That's the two pessaries on the front right, um, but they have to be removed on a daily basis, ideally. And the other pessary which we use a lot of is a shelf pessary. Um, and they're now available in silicon, so they're much uh, less rigid, more comfortable, they're kind of shaped to fit better at the vaginal vault. Um, it's, a, it's a case of hit and miss. Right, so this article which I'm talking about covers mainly incontinence actually and makes the point that the history is really important. Um, it's a way of differentiating between stress urinary incontinence and urge urinary incontinence. So you want to know about the type, you want to know about the severity, you want to know about provoking factors such as cough, which will increase uh, intra-abdominal pressure and lead, can lead to stress urinary, cont urinary incontinence. And urgency is really part of overactive bladder symptoms syndrome which can be managed in primary care using anti-muscarinic drugs so there are a variety of different drugs oxybutynin is cheap and cheerful but causes horrible side effects it is available as a transdermal preparation and some of the newer anti-muscarinics like solifenison cause less dry mouth and therefore they're better tolerated uh, the history is important because there may be contraindications um, Women may have mixed urinary incontinence and you have to decide which is the predominant problem um, in order to determine how you're going to treat it. And then there is unprovoked urinary incontinence, which may be related to fistula. And then ask about associated symptoms, ask about frequency, nocturia, dysuria, constipation, prolapse, neurological symptoms, because incontinence may uh, be a presenting complaint for something like uh, MS, you know, it could be something completely different um, than just a straightforward urogenital problem. And then to determine how bad the problem is for the patient, ask about things like pad usage, what impact the problem is having on day to day living. How much is she drinking? So women should drink about 1.5 litres of fluid a day. How frail is the patient? Is it is that the problem that she's unable to get to the toilet? Would she be better with a commode? Um, sometimes the patient you're dealing with may be super fit. They may be a runner and that causes uh, stress, urinary incontinence. And then I think in a primary care setting, it's not just about the history. And I totally appreciate time constraints, but you really should examine the patient as well, both abdominally and uh, by pelvic examination to determine whether there are any pelvic masses. Urinalysis is really, really important. And even if you send a sample to microbiology and you're told that you haven't reached the threshold to diagnose a urinary tract infection, actually there are some, there are some limitations with that. 
So it may be that these patients actually do respond to antibiotics. It may be antibiotics in association with the trigger. That might be sex. So the patient has a stat dose of antibiotics um, if she has sex. Um, some GPs will be able to do a bladder diary and a bladder scan just to check the post void residual volume. Dep it depends on your setup, but there is a lot that can be done in primary care, and that's really my point. So, vaginal discharge, I think this can be done really simply. So, I'm not in favour of a high vaginal swab. I wish people would stop doing high vaginal swabs because what you're going to pick up are normal vaginal commensal organisms. So all women have lactobacilli within their vagina. That's the normal vaginal commensal organism. And that keeps everything healthy. But they also have E. coli, they have mobiluncus, they have other bacteria. Gardnerella. So if you get an overgrowth of Gardnerella, you get bacterial vaginosis. And if you have an overgrowth of yeast, you get thrush. Um, and as we saw in the previous podcast, having urogenital atrophy can change the microbiome. Um, so you've got a woman postmenopause who's coming with recurrent um, vaginal discharge or symptoms suggestive of bacterial vaginosis, you are probably going to be better to treat her with vaginal oestrogen. Obviously, a sexual history, even in an older woman, is very, very important because you don't want to miss chlamydia or gonorrhea. Um, but I think we have to be... Um, sensible really about about what we do with patients um, so i think using um, vaginal ph paper is really useful if you get um, an acidic ph actually that's normal if you get an alkaline ph that's not normal and your patient probably does have an overgrowth of gardnerella and i think this is the final um area that we're going to cover today it should be genital dermatoses but we will have to wait until that's revealed oh mm -mm. oh it seems to have disappeared and let's just talk about the different common skin conditions so you can get eczema you can get psoriasis um you can get lichen sclerosis you can get urogenital atrophy you can get herpes warts cancer um, so if your patient has something which is not resolving with simple treatment then please refer them to a vulva clinic and then chronic pelvic pain uh, again that's probably a common reason for referral to secondary care many of these women will have irritable bowel syndrome which is best managed in primary care but just make sure you've examined your patient that she doesn't have pelvic mass um, and the other common cause of chronic pelvic pain is endometriosis. And I, I, you know, some of that can, some of the management of patients with endometriosis can be done in primary care, but some of these patients are really hard to manage and they would possibly be better managed in secondary care. I think as long as you've tried things which will stop bleeding. So if you stop bleeding from the inside of the uterus, then you will stop bleeding from deposits elsewhere. And that reduces the risk of adhesions and the risk of ongoing um, pelvic pain. And then just remember to think about pelvic inflammatory disease. So the treatment will depend on the diagnosis. So that's been a kind of whistle stop tour through common um, common problems uh, that affect women and what I hope I've covered clearly what can be done in primary care. And that's the end of today's podcast. <laughs>